Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Ashu Tandon. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, today's session is on drug repurposing, and uh, uh, by two really esteemed panelists uh, joining me here is Dr. Richard Mollard, uh, who's the Chief Scientific Officer of Farm Ost Limited. Um, Richard has a PhD and an MBA with over 25 years of uh, international experience as well as national experience in Australia in biomedical and pharmaceutical research design. He has conducted a number of small therapeutic molecule design projects in France and in the US with Louis Pasteur University, Bristol Myers Squibb, the University of Michigan, as well as Eli Lilly and Company. Richard has consulted for public and private companies in Australia, Asia, the US and UK, and assisted in raising over $100 million in capital. Richard consulted for Pharmas for three years prior to joining his chief scientific officer in 2017. And we are extremely happy that you're, uh, you've joined us here today, Richard. So welcome aboard and thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much, Ashu, and thank you for having me here today. Wonderful. Uh, we are also joined here today by my colleague and good friend, Dr. Kenneth Barr. Kenneth's the Senior Vice President and Head of Discovery Services for Sinjin International. Uh, along with me, he's also a member of the Executive Committee uh, for Sinjin and is responsible for helping drive not just strategy for Discovery Services, but also the strategic direction for uh, the overall firm. Kenneth has over two decades of experience in the area of drug discovery for both small and large molecules and has been associated with some really nice and marquee organizations such as Merck, Forma, Sonesis, uh, etc. Prior to joining Sinjin uh, almost a year and a half or so ago, Kenneth was the head of R&D strategic global operations at Forma Therapeutics um, in the Cambridge uh, and uh, in the suburbs of Cambridge. At Pharma, Kenneth was responsible for driving research effectiveness through a combination of optimizing both their internal as well as their external R&D research efforts and provided key alliance management leadership for key relationships that, uh, that Pharma had. Kenneth holds a PhD in synthetic organic uh, chemistry from MIT and has also studied, also pursued his postdoc in natural product synthesis from the University of Texas. So. Uh, Kenneth's been uh, in some pretty interesting cities and states his whole life, and his current uh, current innings at Bangalore uh, is no less interesting. So, uh, so once again, Kenneth, thank you for joining. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Right. So, Richard, before we start, tell us a little bit about Farmost and uh, the good signs that Farmost has been doing and how they're helping patients. Well, thank you very much, Ashu. So, Farmost is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and. If you look up the statistics, there are a lot of threes, which might be quite auspicious, but we have a market capitalization of approximately $33 million. We have about 300,000, or 300 million shares, sorry, on offer. The top 20 shareholders own about 36% of the company. There are about 3,300 shareholders in total and we have about 3.6 million dollars in cash so we're a lean operation and we're very we have a very nicely structured balance share at the moment a very nice supportive shareholder base we became a medicinal company really in 2003 with the acquisition of epicet which is a fine chemicals manufacturing unit in 2013, Pharmos uh, became a diversified medical healthcare company with the acquisition of Pitney Pharmaceuticals Proprietary Limited. And Pitney owns the rights to Monopantil as a cancer drug. And Monopantil is an amino acid nitrile derivative. And Pharmos owns the right to a suite of these derivatives. Um, in a number of therapeutic areas. So far most in terms of repurposing, there are a lot of definitions for repurposing. Some people are very strict, some people are a bit more lenient, but monopantil originated as a anthelmintic who was developed by Novartis Animal Health to treat worms that infect sheep. One of the original directors, he was the head of oncology, head of oncology at a hospital in Sydney, and also a hobby farmer, sheep farmer. He found his drench looking at the molecule, 
and understanding the class and molecule may have some anti-cancer activity. So he bought some monopantal, tested it in cell lines, found it had very good anti-cancer activity, selective, without too much effect at all on healthy cell lines. He investigated a number of pathways, so which are implicated in cancer. One well-known pathway is the mTOR pathway, and he found this inhibits mTOR pathway, that is monopantal. So originally as an anthelmintic, it acts down the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor pathway as an allosteric modulator or agonist to give spasms to the worms that infect sheep and cause paralysis. And here in mammalian cells, which do not have these specific subclass of receptors, it's always been known to be a very safe drug. It was a surprising discovery to find and cancer activity and acting down the mTOR pathway. So, Keeping on the repurposing then, mm. um, Pharmos has taken it into a phase one trial in humans. A phase two A and two B trial in pet dogs with cancer. And understanding how mTOR pathway affects in inhibiting translation of proteins, inducing autophagy or apoptosis. Pharmos is now looking at uh, repurposing again or moving sideways with the drug to use it as a therapeutic against an antiviral for COVID-19 because we understand viruses hijack cellular machinery involved in autophagy through the mTOR pathway and also in neurodegenerative dis um, diseases because we understand autophagy is very important for clearing misfolded or processed proteins that lead to new neurodegenerative diseases. So that's a bit of a snapshot snapshot of the company and that's where we're up to it. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's really interesting. Um, you know, when, when we started talking internally about this topic, um, you know, my first reaction was that, you know, drug repurposing as a concept has been there for a number of years. So is this just a case of uh, old wine in a new bottle? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And, and you know, uh, once once uh, we hear from you, Richard, I'd like to hear Kenneth's view as well uh, uh, on this topic. Well, old wine in a new bottle, maybe, but maybe with wine, they <laughs> mature and come better with age. So there is a lot of work being done with repurposing and Traditionally, people suggest, oh, maybe it was, you know, um, serendipitous discoveries like thalidomide, mm. where that was used as a sedative for pregnancy, but gave birth defects. And yeah. Then people wondered, and these birth defects were truncations of limbs, and people will study chick embryos and saw, well, it's inhibiting capillary growth, new capillary growth. And this mechanism, people thought, well, maybe that is involved in cancer. You can start the cancer of its nutri nutritional requirements. So it tested as an anti-cancer drug and so repurposed along those lines. And tamoxifen is another good example as well. Viagra, they all say these are serendipitous, but you know, they're still hypothesis driven. You have workers like Pfizer and Craig Jordan for tamoxifen and these products, you know, a foul contraceptive, understanding estrogen receptors, antagonism, how this can be moved to a different disease and be a very successful anti-cancer drug, perhaps saving the lives of maybe 500,000 women so far. But repurposing is becoming more popular, presumably, because people understand the quicker time, or potentially quicker time to market and potentially lower costs. So traditionally, when you think of first principles, people suggest, you know, 1.6 to 2.6 billion dollars, 13 to 15 years for the drug discovery program. And maybe with cancer um, drugs, the success rate is less than 3.5%. So repurposing is suggested to cut this down to maybe 300 million dollars and five or six years, but of course, there are always caveats. 
But one of the biggest developments, I think, has been artificial intelligence in the last 10 years. And every year we see more powerful databases come along whereby people can mine these databases and make hypotheses based around their drugs. So, you know, as little as maybe five or six years ago, you had C maps or connectivity maps, which may look at 3,000 um, inputs. And now people are looking at real world data from insurance claims, electronic health records, and they can set up virtual controlled trials of 1.2 million subjects, for example. So the power is becoming extremely um, stronger these days. And I think people are using this techniques to get a foot in the door for these um, repurposing technologies. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Kenneth, I'd love to hear your views. Uh, particularly, I know you've got um, a lot of emphasis that you're placing on on research informatics and and the power of using uh, computing and and maybe you, you know you could give us your perspective on on the topic and and particularly the use of informatics uh, in this area. Yeah, thanks, Ashu. As I was listening to Richard. I was I was thinking through that. So so what he said is absolutely correct. Uh, initially, people were looking to clinical observations and reports. Uh, some of the areas in which we've participated more directly and where I, I think there's going to be a lot more room for growth um, for our, our assisting clients has to do with um, phenotypic screening and deconvolution of targets that way using known drugs. But also the, just the incredible growth and understanding of the mechanism behind the diseases. And, and what Richard was saying in the end about AI and, and just using computational methods generally is, is critically important. So um, he mentioned repurposing the context of COVID when uh, the pandemic first began, uh, our group was also heavily involved in, in efforts along these lines uh, and identified a couple of different potential targets that we, we thought made good sense in terms of where they sat in pathways and what their, their safety uh, could be as well. So I agree this is an area of great importance and being able to, to assemble all the critical information and then move very swiftly into a clinical proof of concept. Um, that's exceptionally important. So we're really happy to be able to be part of this process as well. Yeah, wonderful. I just wanted to sort of pick up on a theme that uh, you briefly alluded to, uh, Richard. One was around um, COVID and pandemic, and, and Kenneth had also mentioned this, but as we are starting to see a lot of um, increased industry engagement, um, you know, part of it was just brought on by the pandemic where everybody was trying to work closely together to figure out a solution. Uh, but I think COVID just accelerated a trend that's been sort of going on for the last few years where traditional competitors are now looking at ways of working closely together as partners or as looking at therapeutic areas, looking at geographical regions for commercialization. Um, what do you think is the impact of this increased level of collaboration on the adoption of drug repurposing? Do you think it's a step in the right direction? Do you think it aids it or it sort of uh, stalls uh, the movement towards drug repurposing? Is that for me? Yeah, yeah. Why, why don't you go first, Richard? You're our guest yeah. here, so you'll probably get yeah. the first uh, first bit set uh, at all the questions. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, thanks for the question. Um, so collaborations are, of course, always very important. And in drug discovery, you know, there's that traditional paradigm where high risk blue sky early research should be undertaken by universities, which are publicly funded because it is too high risk and it has a benefit for, well, it may have a benefit in the future for um, the population. Um, and then at the other extreme, you have the high, the large pharmaceutical companies who traditionally may be more important in the later stage phase three and registration activities just because of their um, supply chains management and reach. So there are so many different components to drug manufacturing. Everybody, no one can be a specialist at absolutely everything, or you can be, but you wouldn't have time in your life to do everything. So, Collaboration is extremely important. And if you're a big organisation and you decide to bring things in-house for your own competitive advantage, that's one strategy. Or you can look for outsourced um, capabilities as well. 
with the advent of um, information technology or the power of it for looking at repurposing or drug discovery, a lot of these activities, maybe they are much stronger in academic institutions um, or privately or in specialists where they can develop their own algorithms or have access to the huge databases and have, you know, and we'll have lots of PhD students, students, cheap labor, et cetera, as well, to crunch through the numbers. So collaborations are always going to be important. So there will be companies like Pharmost who can take things from early stage with the right collaborations with universities, as we did with Monopantel, through early phase one, phase two, attract capital to do that, look for um, large pharma for doing phase three or registration, perhaps for support or licensing, but always looking for outsource capabilities which are going to add value to the company. So I think collaborations always add value to any project. Yeah. Kenneth, how do you see this evolving and, and where do you think uh, uh, players such as Sinjin can have a role to play in, in sort of fostering increased collaboration? particularly with drug repurposing in mind? Uh, it's an interesting question. So um, what Richard was, was saying is, is definitely true. Actually, it's a bit harder for me to follow him because most of his points are actually covering oh. a lot of the ones that I would make. But um, so, no, it's fine. So I, I, I think the point that you made about um, collaboration and accessing innovation is really important. So in the earlier stages of drug discovery, not, not simply in target identification and validation, but the earlier stages of, of identifying that right molecule, um, oftentimes larger companies today are looking for opportunities to, to access external innovation, and that, that frequently comes in the form of collaborations with smaller companies. But as Richard pointed out correctly, um, by the time you move into the later stages of development, it's, it's usually the larger pharma that have the resources to be able to drive those forward. One of the interesting things that we saw in the context of, again, the COVID pandemic, which has really changed the way people think about collaborations and hopefully will extend beyond the pandemic, is um, we saw a number of larger pharma companies starting to come together because the need for speed was so great and the intensity around uh, finding paths forward, either through identifying um, potential mechanisms to, to vaccines or drug repurposing, which was definitely on the table, um, there was a willingness to come together because the incentives were very strong to move quickly. I, I think what we may find is some of the barriers that came down around this particular um, kind of horrible disease that, that is really rocking the country, uh, the U.S. and all over the world, that, that may create opportunities to think about other ways to work together in the pre-competitive space. And in the context of the, the CRO world, so we, we have... Uh, a somewhat unique position in the pharma space in terms of the fact that the IP that we generate is assigned back to our clients. So that um, all of the innovation that we can provide, basically it, it removes some of that stress that they feel around proprietary uh, knowledge and information that they can then use later to their advantage. One of the things that we've been working on recently in the space around target identification and validation, again, very early stage, is that um, there are a number of organizations that have programs that for one reason or another they decided not to pursue, not for scientific reasons, but uh, maybe for strategic regions, reasons. Um, we have found sometimes we have an ability to, to bridge or build connections between organizations that have these really interesting um, programs that have been shelved or paused for some period of time with other organizations that are very interested to find out how to leverage those biological targets for that chemical matter. Um, and then we can act as somewhat of an intermediary, intermediary uh, and even help to, to create programs that drive those forward. So I, I, I think COVID and, and more recent events have just given us a greater opportunity to have these types of conversations because people are more willing to sit down at the table in a way that they weren't before. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it, I, I think it does. Uh, I, I, Kenneth, maybe the next one I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, you about this because I think it's sort of, in line with collaboration, there is also um, an increased uh, awareness that, you know, drug, uh, the time that it takes to bring a drug to market, right, 10 to 12 years or so, that timeline is probably not um, acceptable any longer and acceptable, I say, in court marks, because we all know how difficult it is 
to discover and then develop a drug and bring it to market. Um, but people think that timelines will shrink. And, and you know, we've seen it with COVID vaccines. A year ago, we barely knew about this disease. And now we've got, you know, almost 30, 40 million people worldwide, worldwide who've already been vaccinated with the first vaccines for this disease. So it's, uh, you know, the time to market for the vaccine. And I know vaccines are different than therapeutics, but um, that's really been amazing. So, so in terms of shrinking that time to market, Kenneth, uh, do you think drug repurposing will play a bigger role in the future? I'm sure that it will be one of many approaches. Yeah. Um, so, so certainly is, is people are thinking in more sophisticated ways around this. And as we discussed earlier, the application of um, AI or computational sciences, the ability to aggregate large amounts of data to find a path forward that didn't exist, that will, that will definitely help. But this, this concept of accelerating the time to market, I, I would actually say um, if, you, if you chunk it down into each of the different stages of the drug discovery process, um, there's so much work going uh, ongoing today in terms of how to accelerate that. Again, from the, the target identification and validation space, um, using AI and informatics tools, doing pathway analysis and understanding where the, the highest potential is. Um, then, you, of course, you have to do the validation afterwards, um, but it gives you a, a pretty good starting point. And then when, when you get into the kind of regular expanse of drug discovery where you, you go through hit identification and then uh, lead optimization, those things also being accelerated today by a combination of AI, robotics and automation, um, that's making a really big difference. And so when people used to think of a process that was taking four or five years, we're now trying to figure out how to do this in less than two. Um, just by the way that we, we set up the laboratories, we think about leveraging um, the computational sciences and also um, in having the ability to, to have a workforce that's essentially global or can work around the clock also makes a really big difference. So exactly what you said, it's how fast can you get to each successive value inflection point that eventually drives a program faster into the clinic. And even in terms of trial design, I think we have much more sophisticated ways to think about that today than we did in the past. Um, I'm not sure if we lost uh, Ashley or not, but maybe Richard, if you want to pick up on that, um, any additional comments? Yeah, definitely. I think the COVID-19 um, pandemic really has been an interesting time for drug development. And as you said, it has really given a, an incentive and opportunity for many larger um, manufacturers or development pharmaceutical companies to come together for a common cause. The expectation that drugs can be bought sooner to market, I still think we probably can wait a little while to see how effective this is. Like, it is amazing that 30 to 40 million people have been vaccinated, but of course, it is the first time this has happened that I can think of in under a year you've had a vaccine bought to market from not knowing what the actual target is. and. So it's going to be very interesting to see how all these other vaccines that are coming out on the market now, how they compare and what the long-term effects are going to be. There are a lot of, of course, um, efforts going into the antivirals as well, which are always going to play a role. And one of the early interesting ones was remdesivir, which gained pretty quick approval from the FDA. And that was in pretty record time as well, um, as the only antiviral really to get approval for coronavirus. And that was a repurposed drug coming from hepatitis C through Ebola to um, COVID-19. And now we've seen more recently in November, it has conditional approval for more severe diseases. People are looking at drugs like lopinavir from the HIV project. People have looked like monopantil, there's ivermectin and antiparasitic. We're looking at, as I suggested, monopantil earlier on as an antiviral. So there is a massive amount of opportunities for these drugs existing to be repurposed and mobilisation of resources to see how quickly they can come into the clinic. And of course, if they've got a massive body of safety data behind them already, then that really helps the cause a lot. Yeah. So I, I see Ashley is back. Um, if you don't mind, Ashley, I have a, a follow-up question that um, that I'd, I'd like to ask Richard. Please um, go ahead. Yeah. 
and just kind of dovetailing off what what you were saying. So, um, one of the topics that frequently arises in the in the context of drug repurposing is is questions around how to think about IP and, and how to manage that. And as and I'm really more of a novice to this space than some of the other elements of discovery. But as I've been thinking through that, um, it occurs to me that when we're looking at uh, oftentimes rare diseases or um, areas where there's there's not such a significant population there may be a bit more flexibility there in in terms of how to leverage uh repurposed drugs i i don't know um how you how you think about that so maybe you could share some of your perspective and the ways that you and your team have been thinking about that yeah well i think that's a fantastic and very important question and specifically with some of the orphan diseases where of course it's hard for big pharma to justify the resources where there's two billion for a disease which may affect you know, 600 or 1,000 people, like where's their return going to be? So if you can bring down the cost of drugs by repurposing an existing one to address those orphan diseases, then you know, that is a really fantastic space and purpose or for repurposing drugs. But in terms of IP, yeah, it is very interesting. If you own the molecule, the manufacturing rights and the use, then it's a bit more straightforward. But if you're a company like Farmers who made a discovery that an existing drug owned by somebody else might have this alternative use, then you really have to think about your IP line. You don't want to infringe on um, the owners of the intellectual property and I think as what the directors of Pharmos did, they established very good relationships with originally Novartis who owned the rights and then Alanco who owned the rights, which really facilitated the way forward. And when you're thinking about intellectual property, you're thinking about composition of matter. So, you know, there's a patent around the molecule. How long does that patent last for? You think about manufacturing, the route to manufacture can be patented as well. And then there's the use. So if you're repurposing, maybe that hasn't been patented. So in Farmost's case, Farmost came up with the idea, did the experiments, put the patents on as an anti-cancer drug, and then went originally to Novartis and said, you know, your drug, strangely enough, has anti-cancer properties, which no one would have expected. And we would like, you know, to go into a licensing deal with you and give you first right of refusal for any future development and setting up those um, relationships early on I think is important but you don't want to give with repurposing you, I don't think it's very useful to change the way patents are awarded people still need an incentive to um, invest all this time and money into first principle drug discovery and without that you know of course you run out of drugs to repurpose at some stage so you're always going to have to go back to I mean, to first principles. Um, repurposing has its place as well, but yeah, the patent position does require very careful thought. And, and one one question that I would have on on that with respect to patent specifically is: Is there a difference between the the patent protection life or composition of matter and identification of a of a novel use for a known material? A difference in what time frame? In the, or? Yeah, in the patent protection timeline, yeah, exactly. Well, usually they come under the same patent class, and so you would apply for a provisional patent and then go on for unprovisional patent protection. But I guess I'm not an expert in um, patent protection, protection, but there are a lot of different strategies around prolonging your patent. So for use, you can pick a fence by um, combinational therapeutics, for example. And with composition of matter, it might be quite difficult unless you're looking at a class of molecules and you have that in your original patent. And you find that a mimetic has better activity than your actual original molecule. So I think the terms are the same, but the strategies around them might be quite different. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, uh, thank you for that. My apologies. Uh, my computer just decided to do a, a reboot, but uh, luckily uh, both of you stayed on. So, so thanks for that. 
I did want to pick up on a question that some of our um, the audience had asked Richard and that was sort of uh, how does one really start by looking at um, a set of drugs uh, that are in the market or have been you know have, have been used for some purpose and sort of link that to a particular therapeutic area and so trying to sort of get that magic spot so So, so, so talk to us about sort of the, the the thinking process, the scientific analysis, and and sort of the management decisions that you take as you sort of try to to find the right fit. Yeah. So there's the basic research systemic approach, um, or systematic approach, sorry, and then there's a heavy reliance on bioinformatics approach. So companies like Pharmos. you have an idea or create a hypothesis that this class of molecule might be suitable for this type of disease just based on precedent and you undergo the test in the laboratory to formally prove that otherwise there are a lot of um data sets that people can actively mine without even any proof for idea um from first principles that it may have an effect so there are what are called um transcriptomics databases um proteinomics databases lipidomics databases there are um databases on adverse or side effects and all of these databases can be probed for your drug versus another drug and if there are similarities then you can make hypotheses based upon well if this drug is having this effect at the genetic level or the protein level and it's used in this disease or is giving these side effects in this disease and maybe it's applicable for this similar disease so you can go about things that way there's um a lot of targets for specific diseases that are understand understood now in proteins for example like specific docking sites so people might think oh this specific docking site in a protein is important for B cell lymphoma. So let's create a molecule which is going to sit there and either agonize or antagonize it. So you can create drugs that might be target those proteins and and in the reverse order as well. You have a drug and you think oh, I wonder what it's going to be useful against. So we'll take this, we'll look in our databases and see best matches to see which proteins it might affect and what are um, yep. diseases that might be relevant to i mean there are just so many possibilities and databases to look at now genome wide association um screens as well where you're looking at point mutations in genes and you can work out whether your product um hits that same gene which has been associated with specific disease types as well but there are always hypotheses Well, at some stage they have to be a hypothesis driven you have to make hypotheses around the research you're going to do you have to set up the experiments and the advantage of the repurposing is that if you have a drug that already has a, an enormous safety profile then you really can confidently move forward even if you're having troubles tinkering with the dosage form the frequency the um the quantity you're giving it you always have a background confidence that you're not going to hit safety concerns so you're only really looking at it you see yeah and and when when you sort of move from um, the uh, the IND stage on to the clinic are there any specific uh, challenges that one faces in the clinical development phase uh, versus if you were you know just a brand new uh drug looking for a you know an indication that you that's an early research work on are you talking about a repurposed drug here yeah i think so so for a repurposed drug uh, you know what are sort of some of the clinical challenges that you face that are unique okay so it depends on your definition of repurposing for example so people say monopantil in pharmacies is a repurposed drug but it's actually a veterinary product yeah moving into humans and some people like to say well it really has to be a product already approved in humans for one set of diseases which is applicable for another it yeah. can't be a drug for example which is used for pancreatic cancer and repurposed for colon cancer some people suggest that's not a correct definition it should be something like 
the diabetic drug in humans, which is used for cancer or a different yeah. disease class. So moving into the clinic, there are some considerations to think about. So for example, if you take a diabetic drug and you find that it's great for esophageal cancer, um, and it's an oral dosage form. With esophageal cancer, maybe it's difficult to swallow the form, so you have to think about the presentation. Maybe the dose is different, and you have to determine whether the pharmacokinetics or the safety for that specific dose has already been done, and the duration can be different. The frequency of dosing can be different as well, so then you're looking at um, bridging studies to see if you can match pharmacokinetics. Formulation work can be difficult as well and have to change. So, for example, with Pharmos, we were looking at a sheep drench, which was put down the back of the sheep's throats. And you know, apparently, well, it tastes really disgusting and it's not a druggable form for humans. So we had to make a tablet from that. And we found it wasn't the drug that had the bad taste, it was the excipients in the formulation. So yeah. there's work that goes into all of that as well. So. You really just have to be on your toes and look at every component of the um, value chain to see what needs tweaking and changing. But if you're lucky, you know, the dosage form can be exactly the same, the dose can be exactly the same, and going into the clinic, if that's the case, then all you're looking for is efficacy. Yeah, no, that's good. You mentioned something which caught my attention, and I think Kenneth also reacted to that when you talked about monopental being used for animals and then uh, being repurposed for human usage. I always thought the traffic was on the other side. Uh, so this is certainly a unique case. Well, it is a very interesting case. And far more strategy was to bring it as an anti-cancer drug, firstly in the veterinary field. So we're moving it from sheep to dogs. Yeah. and then doing proof of concept in dogs and using that information to go into humans. So for farm it was it has been quite straightforward because there's a lot of publicly available data on use in dogs already in the preclinical work, which was conducted by Novartis to gain regulation as a ship anthem because you need you know, one rodent and one non-rodent species. So there's a lot in the public domain already and their summaries, but we were able to take that work to demonstrate to human ethics, research ethics committees that it is a safe drug. We're able to show them our preclinical work, use it in humans. Of course, having all the preclinical data in dogs means all of the pharmacokinetics and safeties for that specific species has already been done. And we've contributed to that with our reformulation strategies as well. So taking from healthy beagle colony safety studies into um, dogs with disease is quite linear and uh, intuitively easy step. Well, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Certainly learned a lot uh, in this discussion. So, so Richard, one of our uh, attendees, Bruce Bowman, uh, has asked a question saying that, you know, if you identify a repurposed drug with new therapeutic activity, where do you find the investors? So this oh. is more on the business side rather than on the scientific side. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's up to the acumen of the individual who's done it or otherwise part of the university. If someone in the you know, academic institution has um, come up with an idea. So, you know, often the best course of action is to invest in it yourself, if you believe it, because that means you're going to own more of the IP. As soon as you get into any sort of agreement with a venture capital or an angel or a more sophisticated um, institution like an investment bank, then you're going to lose leverage and they're going to want ownership for putting their money in. So people look for family and friends. People do things out of garage because I've done that myself with some projects where you do things in total isolation and make sure you have all of your techniques and outcomes mapped out and good proof as well and you try to find the lowest cost means of doing that mm -hmm. and you know you work night times you work on the weekends after sure. you put in effort and you reap the rewards if you have a drug and you don't have the capacity to do that and you want to seek venture capital or um, other funding it is 
I think very difficult for very early stage because it is always extremely high risk. So often you've got to be willing to put your hand in your own pocket. And if you don't, and you're lucky enough to find a partner with deep pockets, you're going to have to share um, the future benefits. Yep, no, absolutely. You know, this, uh, um, this sort of links to one of the questions that I had, uh, up, uh, you know, a couple of questions later, but I'm just going to bring this up forward. Uh, given that you've been in the drug repurposing segment or sector um, for a number of years now, um, you know, what are some of the key learnings that you would share with our audience in terms of, of things to things that you've learned? And, and if you were to do this all over again, here are, the, here are the five things you would really focus on early on as you're getting into this, uh, this area. Five things, okay. So I think... You can go more than five. If you have more than five. <laughs> <laughs> I think repurposing, if you, own, if you own rights to a drug already, I think it's quite a good idea to look at how that may be repurposed. It's always going to be a risk mitigation strategy and a patent prolongation strategy. So like Gilead with Rem and Sorry? Like Gilead with Remdesivir. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you're leveraging from your own asset base. Yeah. If you don't own the intellectual property around, as we discussed, composition and matter, then I think it's very important to form a good relationship with the company or entity that does because they're going to be your best um, champions. Like if your drug actually does work in an alternative setting and they see an opportunity for licensing, they're going to be very happy with that. So forming a good relationship is very good because they also have a lot of information that won't be in the public domain, things you wouldn't have thought of, and they can help you develop the drug along their internal lines as well. So I think that is extremely important. Um, the opportunities are, of course, that it should be cheaper. So you can leverage off a lot of the safety data that is available. So it's important to do that. It's important to delve deep into this safety data and see what the actual numbers are and what the actual um, animals being tested mean and what the settings are for them. Um, you never know what you find unless you look at the into detail of each subject in a clinical trial and how they react to, to a certain drug and what the outcomes were. You can often find summaries of, you know, 30% efficacy, but, you know, what if the standard deviation is, you know, 100% plus or minus 80 or something. So you really have to have a good understanding of the data set to see where you're going. Um, as we alluded to before, you have to think of whether the dose form is correct. So you can't make assumptions um, that the dosing is going to be fine. So with monopantil, the original people tasted the drug and said, yeah, it tastes fine. But they didn't taste the formulation. So it was a bit of a surprise that the dogs on trial didn't like to taste it. And the, humans didn't like to taste it at all. And so it's important to think about crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's. And often, you know, you don't know until you've reflected on them, but yeah, a lot of homework is extremely important. Yeah. yeah. And, there, and there were a couple of things. Oh, sorry, Ashley. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So there are a couple of things that, that you mentioned in, in your last couple of responses that I to circle back to Richard. So. One of them is you were you were talking about, particularly in the context of moving across therapeutic areas and indications, the difference in the requirements, and you didn't phrase it this way, but it's essentially looking at the, the exposure, pharmacodynamic efficacy safety relationship, right? So um, the way that you have to dose your patients in order to get to that effective level of exposure, um, but also especially the difference between say like uh, an oncology indication versus a non-oncology indication and how we think about the permissible uh, safety profile. And so I, I can imagine that even though the, the drug itself, the API itself um, is the same molecule, how you think about formulation and administration could be dramatically different. Um, and maybe you have some further comments on that based on your experience or some of the things that you've been thinking about. 
Well, that's exactly correct. I mean, if a drug has a certain pharmacokinetic profile in cancer patients, and as you say, the tolerability for um, uh, adverse effect profile in patients who have been refractory to all treatments and don't have any options left, um, the tolerance is much greater than for a patient with diabetes, for example, where we have drugs that are effective and safe, and these people can have it managed life that way. Um, and also pharmacokinetics, as you discussed, the liver is always going to be important in how a drug is metabolised. And if you have a disease like cancer where there's metastases to the liver or you have hepatitis C where there's direct liver involvement, then the pharmacokinetics are going to be very different. So you really have to think about the disease setting and see what dose rate is going to be tolerable. So it, it isn't all smooth sailing, but there are data sets you leverage from, which hopefully shorten the time. And they yeah, and what you're describing, it must, it must be very similar in terms of when you think about moving across species, right? So, so animal to human, non-human animal, so dog to human, for example. Um, there will be differences around things like metabolism and exposure in most cases that you have to work your way through. Also, um, the difference between um, companion animal health and human health in terms of what the marketplace will bear, um, the types of risks that people are willing to take in terms of the trials, um, what the what the market reward is. So I'm sure that those are also factors that you've had to think very carefully through as you've, you've been setting your strategy. Yeah, exactly. And with the companion animal space, there is becoming a significant market for um, pet care, although traditionally it was quite small, but it still doesn't reach the huge um, financial gains that you can see in the human market. So with companion animals, for example, with dogs, we would never expect to be a multi-billion dollar company based on having a product for um, an anti-cancer drug. I think the market is somewhere between half a billion and a billion, although people aren't sure what it is. So it depends how much, because you know the data isn't quite isn't there quite frankly. People have best guess estimates at it, but it will depend on how big of the market share you can capture. But for companion animals with cancer, their cancers are ostensibly exactly the same as humans. They develop under uh, immune system, they develop in, immune, in a living system. They're often developed from the same mutations in different oncogenes, for example. So in theory, the drugs should be directly translatable across. Um, traditionally in the vet market, they've only been beholden to what's happening in the human market because people haven't wanted to develop drugs for the pet market because there was a lack of return. So people bring things across. Um, but it is gaining momentum. People are caring more about their pets these days. People are willing to spend five or ten thousand dollars to look after their dogs. So there is a bigger market for that. Um, it was interesting what you said about pharmacokinetics across species. Of course, yeah, I didn't mention that, but it is a very interesting point. With our drug, the half life is substantially longer for the major metabolite, which is active in dogs than it is in humans. So we're looking at several weeks rather than 24 hours, for example. So the way you administer it and frequency does change between animals, but as we've discussed, the safety profiles are there, efficacy is there, so it's just, you can go forward with confidence between the species. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. So so Richard, we've, we've got about five minutes left and I, I do want to have a couple of questions. Uh, from the audience uh, uh, as well, um, you know, um, w when it comes to repurposing, I, I I gather that having a very robust externalization strategy and a, and a uh, you know uh, a strong set of partners such as you know Synge and another CRO CDMOs that you work with is probably very critical. So can you sort of talk to us about how you know you sort of see this external network? coming and sort of fitting into your strategy of making Pharmost a success? So Pharmost is a company which is very lean. We have four directors yeah. and myself as 
management. We have two managing directors. I'm the only manage, part of the management team that isn't on the board. So we have an entity of five. We have our subsidiary Epicam, which runs its own business. Uh, it is profitable and has revenues of, I think, 3.6 million last year. So outsourcing for Farmost is extremely important. I mean, every function, basically, we outsource. So early drug development, we have a fantastic relationship at the moment with the Living and John Cancer Research Institute, and we're looking at mechanistic pathways for that. So we support them. They have the infrastructure in their laboratories, and they support us with preclinical work. For formula reformulation, we looked at a company called BRI in Canada who did a fantastic job for us taking the mm. drench to a tablet. We look at Catalan, a tablet manufacturer in the US, for example, and we look at US entities and Canadian entities for um, phase one trials in healthy species like dogs or rats. We um, leverage from uh, Australian-based companies because of the generous R&D tax rebate in Australia if we do this. So we've been working with Tetra Q in Queensland to analyse our blood samples, for example, from our clinical trials here. And then, of course, there's Syngene. And Syngene played an extremely important role and still is for far more drug development. And we're lucky enough to have a very good relationship with Syngene. And we asked Syngene to come up with a manufacturing technique for our drug and if you remember from the introduction we own the rights to a suite of amino acid or nitrile derivatives which a lot of them we've demonstrated in preclinical work have anti-cancer activity but monopantil is our lead anti-cancer drug so big farmer owns the right to manufacturing they can manufacture monopantil but can they manufacture our alternative molecules, so why would they for it? So we asked um, Syngene to come up with a manufacturing capability for us, a GMP manufacturing capability, so we could apply that to our whole suite of amino acid and nitrile derivatives. And that for us has been an extremely successful outsourcing operation as well. So at every link in the value chain, yes, we like to outsource. We have expertise in-house where we can have conversations. So, for example, for discussing with Syngene, we have 16 PhD chemists at Epichem who can get on the phone if me with my background in molecular biology doesn't understand how a phenol group, you know, links with a benzene group, for example, and have the discussion with the chemists in Syngene. So, we have our in-house expertise, but yes, we rely heavily on outsourced operations. Wonderful. Thank you. No, I think that's really helpful. Um, we have time for just one more question. And, and this is something I'd looked, I would I thought about asking. And it's also come in a couple of the private questions that I've been getting is, uh, um, you know, we don't normally hear about the pharmaceutical industry in Australia. And, um, and, and personally for us in Sinjin, we've actually been seeing some interesting clients across different areas, more so on the, on the development and manufacturing side, both for small and large molecules. But if you could, in a couple of minutes or so, just talk to us about how the pharmaceutical industry is evolving in Australia and, and what you see is the future out there. Yeah, it's an extremely interesting question. So traditionally, it's suggested that Australians, Australia's competitive advantage in the pharmaceutical business is in early clinical or um, pre-clinical stage drug development because we have very strong academic institutions and a very good research yeah. base. And on the other side of the spectrum, people like to use Australia's clinical trial capabilities because we have very good hospital systems, very good um, technological systems for monitoring the patients and very good patient subsets for um, testing drugs which may be suitable for bigger markets like the US or Europe, for example, like right? similar demographics. So, Farmost is set in the middle where we have a capability of bringing drugs from very early stage development into the clinic. And I think Australia has about 250 such therapeutic biotech companies. Um, with the changing situation now with coronavirus, specifically in Australia being the market, 
and shutting down the borders. It really is a, going to create an interesting paradigm for the pharmaceutical world. Companies like Pharmos with a very well structured and strong balance sheet and very good international relationships with outsourced functions, we can do very well like it's business as usual for us. Yeah. Clinical trial centres, it will be business as usual because the hospitals are essential services. There might be changes to the amount of time staff can be put onto clinical trials and sometimes if there are lockdowns, for example, clinical trial um, progression may be disrupted, but the systems will always be there. Universities, though, are suffering at the moment, and this is largely due to the change in their financing paradigm. So about 10 years ago, maybe, or more, the universities saw the opportunity for um, international students and the lucrative market that is to bring them into Australia. So their financial model is heavily, heavily dependent on um, international students. With closing the borders to overseas guests, this has dried up a lot and universities are looking at how they can change their financial paradigm at the moment. And there are estimates that in the next three years, you know, they'll see a $19 billion hit to the university sector. And I don't know I have verification of the numbers, but we know that universities are really considering how they might change their offering. And so, of course, this is going to filter down to research activities and time people spend in the lab. And when you think about the repurposing drive, maybe there's a niche now for people in Australia who have a strong medical background to work great more intensely in the intellectual, um, or sorry, in the artificial intelligence field by mining databases, coming up with virtual um, targets and virtual drugs which can be translated into, um, well, down the track by companies such as Farmos into the clinic. But I think we'll see a big shake up of the very early research development phases, but as I was suggesting, people like Farmos are doing well, can benefit, and I think the clinical trial sites will benefit. Well, we don't, on a last note yet, we don't have the luxury of having a big anchor farm at headquartered in Australia, like you might do in San Diego, or you might have in the Boston area, or Cambridge and Oxford, for example. And when you have those anchored headquarters and you have the um, venture capital sitting next to them, you have the angels sitting next to them, you have the sophisticated investors. In the US, you can have super funds investing in that technology. You have biotechs um, sitting around them. They translate to the university systems that are strong there as well. You get the whole value chain. So Australia is a little bit different. And yeah, it may be the basic research in the next few years, which is going to happen in different ways to offer value. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that's been really helpful. Um, that's all for us. We've actually gone over time. Uh, but I do want to thank you both for, for the time, Richard, especially for you. Uh, I look forward to uh, you know successful collaboration with Parmos. And uh, once again, thank you so much for the time. Kenneth, thank you so much for the time uh, as well. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much for having me on, actually. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.